So let's try to recap real quick before we, before we move on. Um, of course, our hub scripture is 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. For as much then as Christ has suffered in the flesh, for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. We found out that separation from familiar is suffering in the flesh and that separation anxiety, a definition, would be a state of distress felt from being separated from familiar. And that's where the separation anxiety... What were you talking about? See, because sanctification is separation. You can't keep doing what you're doing and be sanctified. In other words, you're going to have to make that decision to separate from some things, for some people from some activities, lifestyles. And just like Paul said, Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. So sometimes, the, sometimes your sanctification, sometimes the suffering of separation, because that's what separation does, there's a suffering involved because you're with familiar. Sometimes it's not something exactly sinful in of itself. God just says, I can't take you where you need to go until you leave this behind. Or I can't profit you enough unless you do this over here. Amen. And so sometimes it's not something sinful in itself. In of itself. It's just that he wants you to separate it from it because he sees your tomorrow. Amen. See, there has to be a separation to to achieve success. We talked about that, that successful people will tell you it's not about all the hard work that they put in, they put their whole life into this as much as is, is that I couldn't have done that unless I left all this behind. So sometimes it's not about what you're trying to reach to obtain. Success comes from what you're willing to let go of. Hallelujah, that'll preach. And the only part that has life in it is the seed. And that's the part that God's wants. Because it's the only part that's got life in it. And God will peel you for the purpose of planting you. Why? Because the seed must be separated in order to be sown. (laughs) See, there's it's separation. It's kind of cruel to crack into that apple and start peeling stuff away. Last week we talked about threshing. That's a violent act threshing is. To break open that stuff. Why? But it's just to get to the seed because that's the only part that has life. And you can't be sown until you're separated. Think about how many people in the Bible God had to separate. Come on now. Moses, I got to get you alone for a while. Abraham, you got to come out here in the desert place for a while. Paul, I got to have you just me and you time before I send you all over the known world. The Holy Ghost said, Jesus, you need to come out here into a desert place. I got to have you separated. Oh, amen. So sanctification is separation. Amen. And threshing, we talked last week, is the mean by which, means by which we separate, listen, what's not desired from what is. I want that. That's what I want. That'll take me where I need to go. That's a part of God's plan. All that other stuff, got to go. But we wrapped ourselves tight with it. Yeah, so that's why it got to be threshed sometimes. Sometimes you got to beat down on it to break it open to get what you need. And it doesn't feel good. But I've never been known to preach a feel-good gospel anyways. Amen? Even though the gospel itself will make you feel good, the separation from all the other stuff sometimes doesn't. (sighs) Because it's familiar. One more point before we get into new territory. Yes, there is suffering and separation, but there's also great reward. That's where we ended up last week. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek what? That diligently seek your future? No. That diligently seek the promises of God? No. Because if you seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. You diligently seek Him. Everything else is just a byproduct of that. Amen. Are we ready to go to new ground this morning? Amen. Come on with it. Hallelujah.
Luke 8, 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. So we know that God's Word is seed. And remember, the only part that has life in it is the seed, and that's the only part that He wants. It, nothing else will be able to produce life and sustain life. Multiplication is in seed. Amen. So we know that God's Word is seed, and we know that seed produces after its own kind. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Doing a lot of flipping around this morning. In Genesis 1, just going to read 11 and 12, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. We talked about this in one of the other series, uh, in this series, I believe, is that everything that God created at that point is still here today. He has never had to make a new peach tree, apple tree, he has never had to recreate grass. Why? Because its seed is in itself. And as long as you can tap into that seed, you can have multiplication in your life. Amen. What did the master say? If you drink of this water I'm trying to give you to the lady at the well, you'll never thirst again. That, that was fresh. Same principle. Because when God does something that has life, when he gives you a drink that has life in it, you ain't going to have to go back and drink no more. When he gives seed in itself, you don't have to worry about going out and getting seed and planting no more. You just plant what you got and it's going to produce after its kind. It's going to have more seed in it. Right. Amen. Yeah. 1 Peter 1, 23. Let's go there real quick. First Peter 1, 23 reads, Being born again. What are we being born again of? It says, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. So we're born of incorruptible seed. What is incorruptible seed? By the word of God, which we established was seed in itself, which liveth and abideth for how long? It, it, I don't know, maybe your Bible reads that, that, that the God's word liveth and abideth until all looks like there's no hope. Is that what it says? It says it lives and bides until you give up. No. Now, you may give up on it and let go of it, but it's still going to live and abide forever, and it's still going to be there because it's incorruptible. You are born of that seed. Amen. You are born of incorruptible seed. God's Word is seed. Because like we were saying, the only part that has life is it in seed. And He's going to do whatever He can to get to that seed. He has to have separation for the seed because in order to be successful, a seed has to be sown. And you have to be separated, to, in other words, to be sown. Why do you think that some of the greatest people that has ever walked on the face of the earth when they first got started were thought of as outcasts and weirdos? Can you imagine what people even in, in this century uh, thought of somebody like a Steve Jobs at Apple? You want to do what? That's crazy. Nobody's going to go with that. You're living way too far in the future, man. Well, what about Oval and uh, Wright and his brother? You know how many people thought they were nuts? As a matter of fact, they th would think they were so nuts that when they went to test their planes, see, they're, they wasn't from the Outer Banks of North Carolina, but they tested it there out of view and out of away from every... In other words, they left all the haters to test it to make sure it was going to be all right. Because they knew this is going to work. But i got to get away from all the naysayers and all the haters. Plus they had to go to a place that was conducive to what they were doing. Because there was a lot of airflow on the outer banks that could help with the lift. Oh, that's a whole message in and of itself. Because you are a product of your environment. Change your environment, you change your world. I didn't think about preaching when I was in the clubs. And I don't think about going to the clubs when I'm standing up here preaching. Hallelujah. Change your environment. And stay in that environment. You can't just visit every now and then. Lord, help me. I'm about to get off track here. 
You can't just visit church and visit your Bible and just visit these environments and change. I got back from vacation. But if I'd stayed there, I might be changed. I visited. But I'm back where I'm supposed to be. Amen. Hallelujah. And some of y'all have been on vacations recently, and it was nice, but you've got to go where you're supposed to be. And so we also are learning that seed produces more seed. What produces more? Seed. We learned at the front end of this series. That's why it's so valuable. It's the only thing that has life in it. Nothing else is going to reproduce. Well, I want more seed. Why? Because seed will produce seed. <laughs> seed will produce fruit, but seed will produce seed. And the seed is what you need to be able to go on. Is anybody getting a hold of this this morning? Seed is what produces seed. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Separation anxiety. That seed has to be separated in order to be sown. It does not feel good to be threshed and having things broken loose from your life. But the only thing that has life in your life is the seed that is in you, and that's the only part that God that's the only part that's going to multiply. That's the only part that's going to be reproduced. That's the only part that can be sown. Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, might be the firstborn among many what? Brethren. Let's look at John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain or a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it biteth alone. But if it, that seed, die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Amen. That seed has to be separated and it has to be sown. Let me just say it this way. You might have heard that song that we'll never know how much it cost to see our sins upon that cross. You see, God did the impossible by faith because God knew that the only way I'm going to have a family is I've got to sow a seed. Follow me here. And the hardest part about sowing that seed was the separation. So when Jesus was on the cross and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God had to turn his back on his own son. He knows, God knows all about separation and sowing and the suffering in that. God had to be separated from himself in order to sow himself. Because the only way he was going to get of his kind was to sow after his kind. Whew. He knows the pain of separation more than we will ever know our pettiness of separation. Amen? See, we are... God's seed. How is that, what does that have to... I understand some principles involved, but, but what, what, what are we... How does it relate to me? Matthew 13, 38. Let's just don't understand some principles. Let's put it into practice. It's nice to get a nugget and think, oh, that was nice, but it's not going to do... Just like we talked about, a seed is not going to do any good in the barn. You've got to sow it. In Matthew 13, 38, well, let me back up to 37. He answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed, what kind of seed? You're born of incorruptible seed. 
And that incorruptible seed is good seed. And just like what God said in the book of Genesis, he's, he saw all that and said it was what? Good. Don't ever say to yourself that you ain't no good. Don't ever think in your life, well, you don't deserve that because you ain't good enough. Because everything produces after its own kind. And if you were a child of the living God and you're sitting around and you're saying, well, I ain't no good. You know what you just said? You just said he ain't no good. Because you were created in the image of God. You're basically looking right at, you're looking right at God and saying you ain't no good. Why? Because everything produced after its own kind. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Your outer encasement, your shell, your fluffing stuff might not be any good, but the real part of you who is you is good. Amen. Yes, you are worthy. That's why the Bible says in the book of Colossians, he said that we are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Why? Because he sees past the husk and he can see the seed inside. He can see the grain. He can see that part of him that's himself. That's why he can say it's good, because he's good, and he sees himself and his creation. Amen. Hallelujah. And he loves us. And he sees himself in us. Golly, what seems like there was something else in that. Because we are born after his image. We are a fruit after his own kind. We're his. When you wanted a family, guess what you did? You planted a what? You planted a seed. Well, so did God. Amen. And in verse 38, it says that the field is the world. And the what kind of seed? The good seed. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Not everybody because the tares are the children of the wicked one. But if you're born again, you're good seed. How don't you ever let anybody put you down and tear you down, make you feel like you're insignificant, that you don't measure up? Or that you ain't got what it takes. Amen. If you're God's child, you are good seed. Well, I thought you said earlier that the seed is the word of God. It is. Jesus is the word of God. And he's the firstborn of many brethren. Yes. Can you... Did I say that? Did I go too fast? It's not that just... Well, how can we be good seed? But I thought you said God's word is seed. It is. We are produced after a kind. That's why we are good seed. We are good seed because we are from Jesus, the firstborn, which is God's seed. And God's seed is his word. And his word is seed. Are you following this? Is this too heavy? Please don't let this go over your head. That's why you are awesome. It's because you have him in you and you are after his kind. And if you start looking at all the outer casings and the shell of everything else, you're going to miss the miracle of who you are. God only wants His seed. But there is something His seed is encased around that has to be removed in order to access his seed. He only wants his seed. It's the only part that has life in it. It's the part that is of him. You are produced after his kind. You are the God kind. But there's an encasement around all that that has to be removed. That's why the peeling. That's why there's threshing. Because our encasement is our flesh. There's not a beat down on you. There's a beat down on this flesh. 
Because unless there's separation, you can never really be sown. And you cannot have success with the seed until it's sown. I am saying something in the house of God today. You bring order to chaos by separation. See, God wants to bring order to your life. And you think the devil's beating up on you when the whole time God's got his hand in it and he's trying to separate some stuff in your life because you got way too much chaos going on in your life and he's trying to bring order to chaos by separation. Amen. Amen. Because it says the earth was without form and void. Some translations say it was in a chaotic state. So what did he do? What did he do? How do you bring order to chaos? By separation. He said, land, you go here and you ain't going any further. Firmament, you come up here and you ain't going to go any further. Any further. The skies, you're up here and you, that's, that's all as far as you can go. Water, you can only go here. And what happened? He brung order to chaos by separation. You can't pray chaos out. You can't anoint yourself with oil enough to get it out. You can't fast enough to get it out. The only way to bring order to chaos is by separation. But people that have the most chaotic lives that I've ever seen refuse to separate the things from their life that's keeping it in chaos. And so you can, they come to the altar every week. They cry their tears every week. They're praying every week. They'll even bring money down to the bucket like that's going to do anything. Every week to try to get their life into order. But the only way to get the chaos out is by separation. Hey man, I'm saying something this morning. This will help you in life. This will bring you an understanding in life. When things seem like it's all jacked up and crazy, don't start blaming the devil. Like you're the only one on planet earth that's doing something for the kingdom of God. And he's got all the hounds of hell after you alone. God's trying to get you sown in places, but your flesh can get in the way. And he needs to bring order to that chaos by separation. So just go with God. Let him bring the separation in your life. It's amazing. <laughs> It's amazing how people are so reluctant. They, most people don't let the word of God get in the way of what they believe. I'll say it again. Most people don't let the word of God get in the way of what they believe. I know people that God has said, you go to that church. I know it because he's told me. <laughs> it's up to you whether you want to believe that or not. Amen. He still speaks today. He will speak prophetically. And I know he said, you go to that church. But that church is 45 minutes away from where they live. So they are reluctant on doing that. Because that, listen, that's inconvenient. But yet if their company says, you know what? You've been working here for six years. You understand everything really good. We need an assistant manager in our store in Montana. And we're going to double your salary. And because our store manager up there is good, but he needs some help or she needs some help. Amen. Amen. Let's just say that. Our store manager, she needs some help and you're the one that can go there and I, we will double your... They will pack it up, kiss the babies and the grandparents goodbye, adios amigo, where's my U-Haul, and pack it up for a double salary all the way to Montana. But, but God will tell you, you need, to, you need to drive a little bit out of the way to... To right here. You need to be planted. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to plant you. He's trying to sow you into a soil. And you will not go into that soil. Why? Because you will not go through separation. Because separation is suffering. It's not convenient to wake up 15 minutes earlier than what you'd like. To spend maybe five, you know, 10 more dollars a week on gas. I'm preaching this morning. You want to hold on to familiar, you want to hold on to convenient, but you will not produce what God wants you to produce until you're sown in the soil that He wants you to be produced in. Good God Almighty, I'm preaching this morning. Because if you're an apple tree, don't go down to the Florida Keys and start planting yourself. 
I don't care how pretty the palms are, how beautiful the water is, you were created to be an apple and you better get yourself up to Washington State and plant yourself in that soil and you'll see the fruit that he wants out of your life then. Do you, are you listening to me? But if you're not planting yourself in the soil that's conducive to who God has created you to be, you'll never produce what God has for you to produce. I cannot take a Sega palm up where I just visited, where I was born and raised in the mountains of North Carolina. I could plant a Sega palm and it wouldn't last a month. I don't know. But I could bring that. Listen, there's nothing wrong with the seed. And it will produce. I've got Segas in the yard every year. It just flops out some more leaves, gets a little taller. It grows. It's doing what it's doing what it was created to do because it's in the soil that's conducive to that seed. Once again, going back to environment, it is in the right environment. If you do not put yourself in the right environment, you will never grow to your potential. You might have a little something, something, but you'll be a little gimpy, 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 wimpy, gimpy. You'll never have a bumper harvest. You always limpy, gimpy. Always just struggling along, barely keeping your head above the water. And praising that you ain't drowning, but wouldn't it be nice to be afloat on a boat? Amen. Hallelujah. I want to be on the boat. Oh, that was good. All people and items concerning the tabernacle, listen, we're separated. You can go in, you can't. This goes here, it doesn't go over there. In other words, it's, <laughs> it's even more, well, I don't want to get in too detail. We're getting things looking good around here, so basically we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, it, leave it the way you found it, amen, put it back where you got it, amen. <laughs> But even in the tabernacle, it wasn't, well, you can take the showbread and just, you know, eat it over here if you want to and just make sure it goes back where it belongs. No, it wasn't supposed to be moved from where it was. Oh, Lord, that's revelation. Are you hearing that? Wherever he said it was supposed to go was where it's supposed to be stayed. Don't move it. Scripture said, Paul said, but none of these things move me. Why was he so successful? Because he was never moved from the location, the calling and everything else. In other words, Paul stayed in his lane. Paul kept sowing in the soil he was supposed to sow in. He never got many, many Jewish converts. It was Gentiles. That's the soil. He loved his Jewish brothers and sisters. He'd always, he'd always throw some seed out there to them. But nothing ever took effect. It was always the Gentiles. Why? Because that was the soil he was supposed to sow that seed into. Maybe you're in the wrong environment. Hallelujah. I can't get off of that. The Holy Spirit won't let me. Because you see, we will fight that sometimes. Even in leadership. As Jephro come to Moses and said, you, you, you got it all messed up. You, you can't keep running things like that. You can't be the one that three million people go to. Your system is destined to fail. You've got to restructure your system. Because the heavier the weight, the more needed of an infrastructure there is. He said some over a thousand, some over a hundred, some over tens. You see, God could call, just try to listen to me metaphorically, okay? Some of it literally, some of it figuratively, okay? Just try to follow along with this. I'm going to try to say it slow. You could be someone that God has called to tens. In other words, you do really good in small settings with, you know, anywhere from literally 10 to maybe 20 people or something. You are an ace. You make everybody feel like a million bucks. You can connect to somebody instantly. You're so good 101. Everybody loves you. They say you've never met a stranger. But put you in front of a thousand people and try to give an oration and get your principles across. You might stand up there sweating and going, uh, 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 
Why? Because you're not called to be over thousands. You're called to be over tens. The person that's called to be over thousands can get up in front of a thousand people and let her rip. But if you go to eat dinner with them out in a restaurant, it's like trying to pull teeth to get anything out of them. You're thinking, well, he's got a lot to say when the mic's in his hand, but man, he's got that in a fork in his hand. He ain't saying nothing. Did you understand me? And the problem occurs is when the person that God has called to be over tens has the aspiration to be over thousands. And leadership can see that and say, your gifting is here, but you want to keep wiggling out of there and want to get over to here for whatever reasons. It's the same principle. You want to be in the soil that's conducive to your seed. Hallelujah. How much time do I have? Thank you, Jesus. I actually got a little bit of time. The land, the water, the sky were separated at creation. All things organized and in order are separated. We separate mailboxes, don't we? You ever heard of anybody sharing a mailbox with somebody else? Even if, they're, even if it's a trailer park, amen, they still like separated. they all in one row, but they still separated. Apartment complexes, they're still separated. Houses are separated, aren't they? Wouldn't it be odd walking to your living room and all of a sudden it's right ne like somebody else's living room too? <laughs> hey, man. Streets are separated, aren't they? What about parking lots? What if there was no lines in any parking lots? You even separate your clothes for washing and dry cleaning, don't you? You don't want to put a new red shirt in. <laughs> Amen. With your whites. We separate men and women's bathrooms. Amen. I know the world, some people in the world don't think that's necessary now. But we do in this house. Amen. We separate age groups, don't we? And we're going to try to do more of that later on in the year. That's why our next project, we'll talk about it, is the room back there. Amen. We separate subjects in classrooms and school. We separate time periods in sports, don't we? Yep. Man, can you imagine playing a pro football game? I don't care if your favorite team is Dallas Cowboys or the New England Patriots. I'm trying to represent in the house. Amen. I'm trying to get on everybody's good side this morning. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Could you imagine literally playing 60 minutes with no breaks? Wow. <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers. I'll do anything for an amen this morning, huh? <laughs> I knew this would be rough. I wasn't going to get a whole lot of participation, but this needs to be said. Anything without separation will become chaotic. But you have people who they organize their life like a 13-year-old boy does his room. And if you, anybody in here, parents, ever had a 13-year-old boy, you know what I'm talking about. Your room, your life can't look like your room. But yet their life looks like the room and they wonder why there's so much, listen, dysfunction. They seem to be so disconnected from things. There's even depression, discouragement. All because you will not bring order to your life by separation. Amen. Anything with, without separation will become chaotic. And God wants your life to be decently and in order, not chaotic and confusing. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14. This is one of the scriptures that denominations like to tag on non-denominational churches to make us seem like that we're out of line. But I, it just de depends on what you define as order. Amen? Because I don't know about you, but when I read my Bible, every time the Holy Ghost showed up in power, come on now. 
Every time the Holy Ghost showed up in power, there was some stuff going on. Matter of fact, the first time he showed up with power, oh, I'm going to get off track on that. The first time he showed up in power, the only thing that the people from the outside could even remotely think about to describe these people were they were drunk. And I know a lot of people today, and I know a lot of people with the term reverend or pastor or whatever tagged on the front or end of their name that if they happened to just be zoomed back to Pentecost that day, they'd be out there in the crowd thinking they were drunk too and out of order. I'm just going to step off of that real quick, but I wanted to hit it too. Because this has been used in the wrong way for a lot of years by a lot of people. Verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion. Matter of fact, if you got a newer translation, it might say disorder. They're interchangeable because disorder is confusion. Confusion is disorder. God is not the author of it. He's not the original. He's not the source of disorder or confusion. It says, but he's the God, the author, the originator of peace. As in all the churches of the saints. You have to bring order to your life by separation. Separation is suffering. It's not easy. But there will be no success without separation because a seed can't be sown until it's separated. You've got to let that flesh, that encasement, that's the whole thing. God's trying to separate you from your flesh. Because your flesh is at end to me with God. Listen, it cannot be obedient to the things of God. What flesh is flesh and what spirit is spirit. Look, you cannot interchange and you cannot cross-pollinate the two. You cannot take a Rockweiler and you cannot cross-breed it with a zebra. Are you hearing me? Because everything will produce after its own Sometimes you got to separate yourself to your own kind. That's why even Pastor Kimberly and I had to separate ourselves. Listen, for good people, people who loved us, it was not sinful. The church was not jacked up. Great place to be. But we had to separate ourselves. Why? Because we were not called for that calling. I don't, I don't have, I love all people, but we have a heart for Mobile. It does not say that we'll never take missionary trips. We have a heart for Mobile. If you have a heart for Africa, God bless you. Because there's a place for that. There's a place for that in the body of the kingdom. But we would never have flourished under a foreign missionary church when we were supposed to be planted in an area and supposed to raise up our Jerusalem. You can't be productive. You can't grow and flourish like that. If you were born to be a great carpenter, but you always hung around electricians, you are so stunting your growth. You've got to... I hope you're getting this. There's disorder and chaos on your life because you've not separated yourself into your own kind. Now, different kinds can complement each other. It says in the body, of, we're all sitting in the body where God wants us to be. But the elbow does not do the same work as the ear. Amen. And you got if you're an elbow, you need to be hanging out with elbows. But there should be a time when you're coming together when we complement each other. Because every joint supplies, it says. Even though I'm not called to what you're called to over there, there's going to be a point in time when we're going to come together as a body. Amen. And you use the gifts and skills that you got. We're going to use the gifts and skills that we got. And we're going to do something. I am saying something here this morning. Lord Jesus, I'm preaching. You've got to be with your own kind. Separation. It's suffering sometimes. But if that car is not going to take you to your destination. I don't care how much you like the car. I don't care how much you love the people that's in it. You've got to change vehicles. You understand that. That's hard in life. Sometimes it's not hard to separate yourself from those that are crazy and all jacked up and you know they're poison. Amen? 
If I keep, it's a poisoned well, and if I keep drinking from it, I'll die. It's harder to separate from good people that love you that you love, but you're not after their kind. Your calling is not conducive to theirs. There's got to be a fork in the road because either you're going to, listen, you're going to hinder them, you'll always be a nuisance to them because you're never going to see it the same way. You're not supposed to see it that way. Hallelujah. Just like there's people that could walk into this building, the first thing they're going to look at, they're going to start looking at maybe the paint job, and they're going to start looking at the, you know, the exterior and, and how things were constructed. What kind of grade steel is that? There's other people that's going to walk in here, and they ain't going to care a rip about anything else. They're excited about that next person that walked through the door. They just want to love on them. And so if you stay with them, you can hinder them. And if you stay with them, you're going to be miserable. Hello. Maybe you're miserable in life not because of what you do, but because of where you're at. Because I could go to Honduras and I could have my pig skin with me. I could be, you know, wanting to play a little football. Because I had not played football in a while and I want to play some football. But they keep knocking this round ball around with their foot everywhere. I can join in with you for a while. I can appreciate the love of the sport of soccer, which they call football. That's what they, they call it football too. Amen? Even though we're calling it the same thing, is it, is it different? You better believe it. Put on some pads and a helmet, and I'm going to knock somebody into next week. Amen? Amen. It's different. And if I'm always hanging on the soccer field, I'm always going to be depressed. Come on, somebody help me in here this morning. Help me a little bit. Maybe your depression, your discouragement, and your disgruntlement is because you're just in the wrong environment. You're not being sowed in the soil that you need to be in. Your aspiration is for something that's not conducive to your calling. And, and if you keep hanging around, you will become stagnant. Anything stagnant starts stinking. My life stinks. Well, maybe it's because it's stagnant, because you're not where you're planted, where you're supposed to be. Amen. That was a nice trip. He's not the author of disorder. He's the author of peace. So that tells us that when you get things in order by separation, there's going to be peace in your life. And it's not just things. Most of your problems in life have to do with people. Not places. Has nothing to do with that job and has nothing to do with that location. More, more than anything, it happens to do with maybe your boss. Or you got people that's kind of crooked on the team and everybody's trying to cheat the system and you won't do it. So now you're on the outs. So you just can't go into work and do your job. Now you got to go into work and you got to battle peer pressure because everybody's haters around you because they cheat in the system and you won't. They taking 45 minutes for lunch and you only taking 30 like you're supposed to because everybody clocking everybody in and out illegally. And you hold on to your integrity. And so you, you got to, oh, you're not hearing me. God will defend you and come to your rescue. God will deliver you by doing the righteous thing. Hallelujah. And if he won't change them, he'll change you. Amen? But you will be in a soil that's conducive to you being soiled, sown in. Because once you get sown in that soil, because you've went through the suffering of separation, you will have success. Amen. Tweet that. But nobody wants to go through the go-through of diligence and separation. I can't leave them. I remember in third grade, man, I was getting punked out. I was getting, I had a beat down coming on me and it hurt. My nose was bleeding. I couldn't get up. I was trying to throw a punch and I couldn't even do nothing. And Leroy come around the corner. He jumped on him too. And between the two of us, we, I, I made it. I made it through that. And now you're 25 years old, and you've got to go in the calling of your life, but Leroy don't want you to go anywhere. I, I thought we were friends. Well, we are friends. That's not changed. But if you hang around, and they'll always throw it in your face, and look, you need to be respectful. Thank you for what you did for me. 
I haven't forgot it, and I appreciate you, and I appreciate that. It's just that where I'm going in life, I have to go here. Well, who do you think you are? I'm a blood-bought, born-again, spirit-filled, spirit-led, tongue-talking, devil-stopping, Bible-carrying child of the Most High God is who I am, and I am who I am because of the great I am. And he said to go right, so I'm going right. I love you, but I'm going to follow my shepherd. And there's suffering in that separation, especially if there's a history. Like I said, it's easy if somebody's crazy. But what if they were good to you and they love you? Okay, let me really break it down. Mama don't want you moving out of the state. But you know God's got a calling for you somewhere else. Are you going to hang on to family or are you going to hang on to your future? Because your family can't give you your future. Doesn't mean you're hating nobody. Doesn't mean you don't have any more, any less love or respect for anybody else. It's just that God has, wants you sown in that soil. Because now you're, you're a fully developed seed. We'll get into that. You can't just crack open anything growing and get the seed out. Amen. It's got to be mature too. But when you're ready to be sown in soil, God will have that separation so you can be sown to be a success. And it might not be where everybody in your inner circle thinks, but you better follow, you better follow God. You'll be unhappy. You'll be miserable. You'll stay in the same place around the same people. I don't care. Y'all can get in your big huddles and pray over it all the time. It ain't going to work in your life until you get out from it and start going where God told you to be. And not many people will go through that effort. Like I said, they're suffering in separation. You love them. They love you. I didn't like leaving my dad this weekend. I didn't know my destiny would be 660 miles away from a home that I was born and raised in. I didn't know nothing about Alabama football or alligators. Amen. I knew about raising tobacco and cows. Amen. Amen. But I know, because God has revealed time and time again, you were a part of our destiny because we were supposed to be planted in your lives. Amen. Guess what? You don't live in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina. <laughs> Amen. You were the soil that we are... See, we're seed and have to be sown. God wanted His kingdom in this area, so He had to sow a seed in this area. And it's not as much geographically the soil as much as the people. Are you hearing this? This is how deep this is getting. I'm about out of time and I'm getting real deep and I don't like it. Amen. He sowed us in your life. You are the soil that he is sowing us as a seed into. And that's why even on your job, you got, you got crazy Freddie. Well, he wants that what you're carrying with him, he wants that seed sown in that soil. Now, we already went through the parable of the sower and the seed. They might reject the seed, but God, you don't have that authority or right to reject the sowing of the seed. That's God's seed, and He's your king, and He told you to sow it. If they want to knock it down in its wayside, that's on them. But He brought you there for them, because He's good and faithful like that. Amen. So God will spend the rest... Can you handle five more minutes? So God will spend the rest of your life here on earth. Listen, this is big. Not adding things to you for the purpose of enhancement. Listen, but will peel away things from you. In other words, separate you from the things or the people for the purpose of making you more fruitful. In John 15, 2, it talks about pruning, cutting away. He's all about cutting away. Why? Because he's trying to get to your core. I can't get to your core unless I cut away. I have to thresh a little bit. I have to peel a little bit. I have to cut it away. Because I know that if I prune you, you'll produce more fruit. Amen. And his pruning is always corrective, never punitive. Don't get that mixed up. God ain't going to beat you over the head with something or, or let something of hell jump on you and it's His will. Amen? Look, we live in a sinful world. Things happen. 
Don't anybody be coming out of here saying, well, God said, pastor said, God sent this on me or nothing. No, that is not correct at all. His chastisement is always corrective, never punitive. Why? Because he's cutting away, he's pruning. And listen, listen, you're pruned if you do and you're pruned if you don't. So you might as well just get used to it. If you're doing everything you're supposed to do, he's still going to prune you to get fruit. If you ain't doing nothing you're supposed to be doing, he's going to prune everything so you can get your rear in gear, dear. Amen. Stand to your feet. Before I go on another 10 minutes, I got five from you, but I've been borrowing a lot of time here lately. I've got to rein it in. I've got to hold back my mule. As the music plays, I want you guys to just... This was very powerful today. Amen. This explains a lot because most of the people that I see out there that are struggling in life. And look, success in one area does not translate in success in the other. You could have somebody that has a very good, well-paying job. They're not worried about paying their rent. They're not worried about making a car payment. But they're, but they're miserable in life. And they'll, they'll do drugs. They'll drink. Sometimes they're addicted to people. Sometimes they're addicted to the work itself. Why? Because their life inside is so horrible. They can't even deal with themselves. They're all jacked up. Have no value system. Have no standards. Don't set up boundaries for themselves. They're loose. They're flowing out everywhere. And you've got to bring order to your life. Most people that are in chaotic situations, no matter what it is, whether it's, you know, like I said, finances, whether it's your emotions, whatever the deal may be, there has to become a point in time where you bring order that you bring order to that chaos by separation. Are you? This is why this is such a important message today. I cannot lay hands on wrong thinking. I can pray for you, but I can't pray you out of where you're at until you make a decision that you need separation from it or from them, or whatever it is. I can hold your hand through it. I can see you cry, but here's the deal. You're going to keep crying until you separate. Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to change in your life until you do. You have got to have separation in your life to bring order. But it comes with a cost, doesn't it? You might have to venture out into a place you're not as familiar with, be around people you don't know that much. You might have to change your habits, what you watch, what you listen to. Look, you can't have a Holy Ghost moment listening to there's a tear in my beer. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want me to pick on anything in particular. I'm just trying to make it, listen, just listen to the principle, not the point, okay? The principle in it. You can't have a Holy Ghost walk on water moment listening to stuff that's just downright depressing and sad. You can't be lifted up hanging around downers. You can't move ahead and save and, and, and be able to, uh, in other words, you, you, you can't invest in your future if you're hanging around spenders. <laughs> Are you listening to me? You've got to hang around investors to learn how to invest good. Amen?